introduce um, our author and our two discussants here. We're excited to have Gabriel Winant, who wrote The Next Shift, which is this terrific book about, um, well, um, I'll let him talk about what it's about, uh, but he is uh, a labor historian at the University of Chicago um, and also a, a labor activist and organizer. Um, I'll let you talk more about, I don't know how much of that you want to disclose, but I'd love to have you share. We also have two nurses from our network uh, who are leaders in their own locals, Felix, Tom Felix Thompson from SEIU 1021 in Oakland, and John Hieronymus from uh, the National Nurses Organizing Committee at the University of Chicago um, Hospital. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Gabe and let you talk for a bit, and then we'll, I'll let Felix and John introduce themselves after that. That's good. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Sarah, and thanks to Labor Notes and to John and to Felix and everyone for coming. Um, you know, I gotta say, for a labor historian, like the dream is that the when you write about workers and their struggles, that you know, workers who are in struggle will then want to, you know, read what you said and talk about what you said and find something useful in it. So it's very cool for me to be able to do events like this, and I really appreciate. Uh, everyone who helped make it happen and everyone everyone who came. Um, so as, as Sarah said, uh, my name is Gabe. I am a labor historian. I do have a kind of uh, maybe organizing history that's worth mentioning in some way. I mean, started in my graduate student union, which was a Unite Here local, where I, I spent eight years uh, organizing it in elected leadership. And um, I've done various things since then in DSA. Um, and currently I I'm volunteering with the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, which I imagine folks here maybe know about, but is a DSA project to uh, sort of support workers organizing in unorganized shops that uh, you know need a little volunteer organizing advice and help. So um, I'm doing that lately. I'm happy to talk more about that if that's useful. Um, I was just saying before folks got out, we just won a victory at a Boba Tea Cafe here in Chicago. Um, so I thought I would spend like two minutes just summarizing the book in an extremely, extremely compressed way. Um, I imagine some folks maybe have read all of it, maybe some have read a little of it, and probably most have read zero to some. Um, so uh, basically, you know, I wanted to write this book because it seemed to me that um, the way that we talk about class and the working class and working class power had not really been updated since uh deindustrialization and that a lot of our kind of if not our fundamental concepts and a lot of our kind of working uh kind of everyday kind of um shortcuts let's say for thinking about class and working class power were really still rooted in the industrial world which is why we were so disoriented by deindustrialization right i mean there's a real material reason for that obviously but then also that led in the kind of academic and the world of sort of discourse about class to say led folks to say well class doesn't exist anymore right and that is I mean, you know, if you are rooted in some way in a socialist or a Marxist tradition, that can't be true, but then that imposes a burden on us to think about, well, what does it look like now? Um, and so that's what I wanted to do with the book. I didn't set out to write about healthcare. I set out to try to answer that question, and healthcare became the way of doing that. Or in particular, the book tells the story of the transition of the city of Pittsburgh and its region from being a steel town, which everyone knows that it used to be, to being a city where um, healthcare is the largest employer um, at almost 20% of all employment now. Um, and I found in the process that that pattern actually, uh, well, it's a national pattern. Healthcare is the largest sector of employment nationwide, uh, around 13% uh, of all jobs. That that pattern is overstated in places like Pittsburgh. That's to say former industrial cities. Um, and that's because the healthcare industry was built as a kind of external adjunct to industrial production, to manufacturing. Um, Healthcare workers were not covered by the National Labor Relations Act until the 1970s. Uh, and that's just one of many ways that healthcare was really kind of created as a kind of mass, sort of a mass service industry to service industrial workers and their really good fringe benefits that they, that they bargained over the course of the post-war period. Um, over the course, course of the post-war period, as I say, workers like steel workers developed really good health benefits in their, one really good health benefits in their contracts. Um, and simultaneously, industrial communities got older and sicker and eventually poorer as they, they started to lose their jobs. And that healthcare industry became 
uh, the most important part of the kind of social safety net to manage all the social harm and damage and dislocation and deindustrialization. And it functioned like that because it was partly privatized. And so someone could, could make money off of all of that social harm. Uh, and so as everything was collapsing in places like Pittsburgh or Detroit or Cleveland or Gary or you name it in the 70s and 80s, um, healthcare boomed. And uh, you know, it was the only kind of only game in town, basically it grew really rapidly because it was something that could absorb, uh, kind of function as a kind of shock absorber of this horrible so social and economic blow that was dealt to these working class communities. It's equivalent in that way to the prison system. It's the only other institution that really prospered. And that's a sort of a dark thought, but I think it's an important one. Um, and uh, that's the kind of basic story that the book tells. And then I try to show how um, the way that the healthcare industry had been designed and set up in the 40s and 50s and 60s meant that when it really started booming in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it continued all of the patterns that marginalized workers and made it hard for them to uh, build power and claim a share of, of uh, you know, economic security in that industry. Um, and that has to do fundamentally with the ways that healthcare is actually hard to turn into a profitable com commodity. It can be done, but you sort of have to fuck up the care that you provide to do it. Um, and that tension, that contradiction is at the core of the kind of hyper exploitative nature of the healthcare industry. And I'll just wrap this up by saying, I think one really clear way of seeing this is that as our society has gotten more and more and more unequal, it's needed more and more care because healthcare is one of the main ways, as I'm saying, that we kind of deal with social inequality um, or one of the main places where we kind of process social inequality. Um, and so we kind of dump inequality on the healthcare system that generates this relentless growth in demand and rise in costs that we all know about, right? Um, and system-wide growth, but that cashes out in the form of system-wide growth. The healthcare system is always getting bigger, got bigger straight through the 2008 recession, for example. <laughs> um, and uh, that's happening at the system-wide level, but because individual firms are trying to make money, hospitals, nursing homes, home care agencies, they're trying to make money and because they can't really replace workers with machines or find good ways of making healthcare provision more efficient without messing it up too badly, um, individual firms are always trying to employ as few people as they can. And that, I think, is a really profound contradiction that's like central to the healthcare industry and how we ought to think about it. And we can talk more about this if you want, uh, right? The system wide imperative for growth and the firm level pressure to stay small. Um, on the, for the employer, right? Because that's how they, that's how they make their margins work. Um, and I think that contradiction is really deeply tied up with our experience of the healthcare system as a place that we need to keep us alive, the real way that it is actually essential. I know healthcare workers hate the phrase essential workers and for good reason, right? But there is a kernel of truth in it. Uh, we do actually depend on you. <laughs> um, and so for that reason, I, you know, the book is trying to ultimately work out an argument for how healthcare workers power and um, socialism and in particular socialized medicine are all irretrievably connected to each other basically. So I'll stop there. I don't wanna go on and on about it, but um, I'm happy to chat with panelists, take questions, whatever you all wanna do. Thanks so much for that, Gabe. Uh, I will hand it over now to John and Felix. Please introduce yourselves and I'll let you uh, kick off the, the questions you brought. Oh, I'll unmute it. Okay. So um, my name is John Hieronymus. I am a uh, nurse rep at University of Chicago. Uh, I work in perioperative care, which is basically um, post-surgical uh, recovery area. Um, before that, I was a medical ICU nurse. I've worked in the ER at Community Hospital on the southwest side of Chicago in Marquette Park, as well as in nursing homes, hospice, and uh, long-term acute care. Uh, both as an LPN and a CNA before I became a nurse uh, or a registered nurse. Um, and uh, I'm also co-chair of the University of Chicago Labor Council, which is where we met Gabe, and uh, have done a lot of the organizing that's kind of made uh, the you know, unions more powerful uh, that would have individually kind of been uh, kind of stuck in their own little cellars or silos, not able to talk to each other. And it's amazing how when you have the same boss, whether you're in a classroom or in, you know, an operating room or in an ICU room, 
uh, you there's still these really amazing like connections to how um, our problems seem to be the same. Um, I'll hand it over to Felix. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Felix Thompson. I'm a nurse at Highland Hospital in Oakland, which is our safety net hospital in Oakland, our, our public, it was the county hospital and it's been semi um, separated from the county in a kind of weird quasi privatization effort, but it's still the, the public hospital and I'm also a shop steward in my SEIU local. Um, and I, this book was really exciting for me because it's the nexus of my interests, which are in workplace organizing, especially in healthcare, but also in um, health, the economy of healthcare, that I think is something that we could benefit from engaging with more seriously or, or with more complexity on the left. Um, so it was exciting for me to, to read your book and feel like I had a uh, framework to think about these issues in that's historical. Um, I think the reason why this these healthcare economics questions are most interesting to me is that I've been a nurse for about 10 years and I've always worked pretty much always worked in some part of even though I've always worked for nonprofits or for the public health system, I've always worked in jobs that are related to either making the hospital money or saving the hospital money. And so that can look like a lot of different things. Um, but one example is I worked for Kaiser. So if you have like, if you have Kaiser insurance and you have a horrible accident and they bring you to the closest trauma hospital, my job would be to look at your chart on the internet and decide if, I, if we could transfer you in an ambulance back to a Kaiser hospital so that Kaiser wouldn't have to pay the bill to this other hospital, right? So I don't do that job anymore, fortunately, but that's like a nonprofit um, hospital model. In my current job, which I really love actually, I work with the high utilizers of the system who are like the folks who come to the ER four times a week or they get hospitalized every month. And it's a really cool job because I get to get to know people in the community. I spend months or years getting to know them. I go to their encampments or their homes and I go to their clinic visits. And if you're like a workplace organizer, it's really cool because I get to like go to all different parts of the health system and talk to coworkers in all different departments. So it was great when we were like getting ready to go on strike and I could have a reason to do like site visits all over the health system. But um, obviously that's not why my employer pays me to do my job. <laughs> they pay me to do my job because it saves the money to keep these folks out of the hospital. So um, anyway, I'm just really excited to kind of engage more around the economic piece and how we on the left should be. Thinking. Um, kind of building off what Felix is saying, I, I became aware of uh, Gabe's book uh, when I was listening to a podcast. And the reason why we're even talking about it now is because after all of my years working in various uh, aspects of healthcare as a nurse, in places where I'm taking care of very underserved patients, uh, in places where I'm taking care of patients who everything is paid for, and it's considered a place that's like a moneymaker for like a healthcare system. Listening to Gabe talk about the origins of the system was the first time I'd heard someone explain it in a way that made sense to how is it that we've gone from hospitals being a place where you know, people go to get taken care of. Um, they're kind of like part of a community, like in my hometown in Ohio, uh, in the in Lorain County, every little town had a small little hospital that was maybe like 25 or 50 beds. Um, and as I was a kid in the 90s, I was watching those get shut down and shut down and shut down. And at the same time, uh, in Cleveland, where I was, at, you know, the biggest city to where I was living, uh, Cleveland hospitals like Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve were just expanding and becoming these huge things that were eating up neighborhoods and driving like property values up and all this crazy stuff. And, you know, um, and Gabe's book was the first time where I kind of understood why is it that University of Chicago Medical Center is this huge employer it's the largest employer on the South Side of Chicago. And not only is it the largest employer on the South Side of Chicago, but 
the medical center makes so much money for the university that we're the largest single source of funding for this huge global institution that's in turning those profits, even though it's a not-for-profit institution, turning those profits into investments, it's leveraging um, the money that they're making and using it to buy up property, building new, huge new capital facility, you know, capital improvements, the sort of things that you would expect in these, you know, big corporations. And it clicked to me a few years ago while I was working with um, my union on our strike campaign and, you know, grad workers on their strike campaign that the University of Chicago is like the 21st century equivalent, not one-to-one, -one, but of like a huge steel mill, like in a way that like me and, you know, other nurses and other workers at the, at the university, both in the hospital and the university side were like, we're really sitting in the middle of this huge engine for capital. And we're the only people who seem to have any capacity to pump the brakes and change how the university maybe relates to the community in terms of, we had a campaign about uh, reopening our trauma center. University of Chicago was, had a trauma center up until the eighties. And ironically enough, Michelle Obama was one of the people instrumental in shutting that down because trauma patients don't pay, right? If you are a young, you know, a teenage uh, male on the South side of Chicago and you get shot, you don't have insurance. You're not getting, you're not bringing in all this money. You're not a liver transplant patient. You're not, you know, a cancer patient. You're not bringing in value into the institution. So we were literally in our community, um, like, like in my neighborhood, there are people who've been shot like a block from my house. But in spite of being next to this world-class institution, you're going to be, um, oh yeah, sorry. So you're going to get sent to somewhere 20, 30 minutes away. And every minute that you're like dealing with being shot is a minute that you're might die. And we had a campaign about that. We talked about it a little bit later, but I'll pass it on to, um, I just wanted to bring us like, that's why we're talking about this because this book is the first time where it started to make sense how we got from small community hospitals, taking care of people to these massive institutions that are like just making money hand over fist. So I'll pass it back. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question, Gabe, of you. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is a hard question, but um, one thing that you talked about that I think is a bit of a hard topic for us in the left is the economic incentives for the providers. And um, for example, in the, the model we're used to, which is the like bed per day payment model, um, the hospital gets paid to keep people in the hospital beds. They get paid for every day somebody's in a hospital bed. And there's many gradations between this and the other version, but the other version is like a capitation model where you get, they get paid to like, um, take care of a certain group of people. And so it's actually cheaper for them if they pay for preventative care because it's expensive to keep people in the hospital. And I think that's a hard topic for us to talk about. Like when we think about like what kind of Medicare for all policy do we really want and what would it actually look like in a concrete way? I think we all get a little anxious about that because we're traumatized by neoliberal policies of like constant taking away. But having worked in a hospital, I think actually it's probably not good for people to have a system that incentivizes the hospital to keep you in a hospital bed. Like, I don't think hospitals are a great place. So you didn't really like go all the way there in the book, but I'm imagining that you started thinking about like what kind of systems we should be looking at. And I know you're a historian, not an economist, but I just, I wonder if you had more to say that didn't make it into the book about yeah that. definitely well you know it's interesting um i mean there's a certain way that, i mean the healthcare system as we all know right it's it's kind of economic plumbing is so twisted in so many different ways um and parts of it work at odds with each other in really complicated ways so um the the uh the sort of payment per day in a bed model in that form doesn't really exists in the way that it used to. So the kind of period of community hospitals that John was talking about, those hospitals thrived on the kind of payment 
you know, per day uh, type model. And they really functioned, and this is a big part of the book, they really functioned almost as kind of what I, what I think of as medium term care. Um, and, you know, I don't think it makes sense to romanticize, you know, that system or that time or whatever, but the reason that people in communities like the place where John grew up or the places in the towns around Pittsburgh that I write about sort of loved their hospitals was because, you know, you had a baby, you could stay for five days, you know, um, or, you know, if, you know, grandpa's arthritis was acting up, you could kind of just sort of check him in if he had good insurance, which he probably did if he was a retiree in a steel town. Um, and, you know, they could kind of keep an eye on him and make sure he was fed and whatever. Um, and that was the kind of advantage of the payment by, you know, the, the, by the day in that way. Um, and it let private hospitals, sort of community, private, nonprofit hospitals, really kind of make a killing off of Medicare and off of collectively bargained health plans. Um, and it grew and grew and grew off that. And that freaked out Congress and led to this change in 83 that I write about in the book. Um, when Medicare moved to reimbursement um, by diagnosis, and we still do this today um, in terms of hospital reimbursement. So like, co but this is what medical coding is, is for, right? And uh, I'm sure folks here who work in hospitals know the term DRG, diagnosis related group. Um, basically in 1983, the Department of Health and Human Services came up with a list of 467 possible diagnoses you could have. Um, and said how much they'll pay a hospital for any of them, you know, with some adjustment by region and that kind of thing. But basically they fixed the price to every possible diagnosis they could come up with. Um, and then the idea was that hospitals can go about this however they want. They can keep a person for a day, they can keep a person for a week, they can keep a person for a month. That's their problem. They know how much money they're getting. Um, and that incentivized, on the one hand, shorter stays for less acute patients. And on the other hand, hospital incentivized those hospitals that could afford it to invest in things like transplants, spinal surgery, cancer treatment. And that's really where the academic hospitals uh, started to really diverge and do much, much better than the community hospitals because they could afford those things. However, uh, doctor medical care, that's say doctor's care, which is a different accounting category and a different kind of economic stream from hospital care, although obviously they overlap in practice, uh, remains on a fee-for-service basis. Um, and so kind of, or often does. Um, and so has this, you know, we have these kind of different kinds of systems and that encourages um, excess care in various sort of ways we, we could talk about or more intensive interventions at times. Um, none of that really directly answers the question, but I think that's the kind of, all the kind of context you wanna know about, think about this question. Um, you know, it seems to me that um, I feel mixed about it, I have to say. I mean, I think in thinking about Medicare for all, um, right, it's true that an important opportunity in Medicare for all is a kind of more rational um, use of our healthcare resources. And uh, the most common way of thinking about this that I find convincing is the idea of global budgeting, basically for hospitals. So rather than, you know, the insurer, especially the public, the powerful public insurer saying, we're going to reimburse by the diagnosis, uh, right, it's perfectly possible for the federal government to calculate what a hospital's budget ought to be um, and just sort of budget that for them in the totality of their operations. Um, and that would remove some of the kind of incentives that you're talking about, Felix. Um, and, you know, I think at some level, in terms of thinking about how to fight for Medicare for all, that makes good sense. Uh, at the same time, though, part of me and I admit to being just torn about this. I'll just be honest about it among friends and comrades. Um, part of me also thinks that there's an opportunity, sort of a political opportunity in the massive overgrowth of our healthcare system. Um, and, you know, it's obviously uh, takes this very perverted and kind of exploitative and grotesque form, right? And it's grown so much be because it has that form that it connects healthcare provision to capital accumulation. But that being said, we've sort of backed our way into this situation where we devote, you know, one in uh, four or five dollars that we spend in this country to healthcare, um, where we devote a huge amount of our kind of collective labor capacity to take, taking care of sick and vulnerable people. And I don't actually think we want to be arguing against doing that. Um, and I think instead, maybe the argument is uh, or in this version, right, the argument is that what if we took this massive healthcare system that we built for these fucked up reasons in this fucked up way and turned it into something, right? What if your hospital 
was designed to be a place for homeless people, for people in all, you know, all kinds of need, right? What, um, what if, I mean, there are kind of interesting experiments around things like trying to get Medicaid to fund housing and this kind of thing. What if we actually said, yeah, that's, that is what it's for, you know? Um, and tried to kind of use the huge size of this institution uh, or this kind of system of institutions as a political lever. Um, and I think, you know, the very large size of its workforce makes it possible to start to imagine a constituency for doing some of that. Um, but I do think those two analyses are somewhat at odds and they both make sense. And I don't quite know how to, you know, work my way through that. <laughs> Um, I know that we're like talking about big things like um, Medicare for all. And as someone who's gone out there and like uh, worked with my union and with political groups to try and advocate for Medicare for all, it feels like a lot of our, um, a lot of our discussion about Medicare for all is like winning a moral argument. And I've, and I'm concerned now that we've kind of like, it feels like we kind of went through the Bernie Sanders moment, that sort of thing. And, um, and it, that seems like that's passed. And now we're back to square one where we might've been like five or six years ago with this sort of thing. And a big part of the book is talking about how union power was really crucial to fundamentally shaping like the politics of the country back, you know, in the, you know, the, the, the forties and fifties. And, um, I'm trying to think of like, how do, we, how do we get to a place where Medicare for all is actually back on the table, but because it's not a, a choice or a moral argument, but because, you know, we have the power as workers to kind of like force that as like a thing. Um, I didn't get like, do you, what are your thoughts about where we, how we're going to, like, what are we going to have to do as union workers, as union nurses to build a kind of labor power that like, the U.S. steel workers had like when, you know, 1954 and they went on strike, the largest strike in the history of the country. Like where, where do you, what is your sense of our opportunities as healthcare workers in unions or who probably desperately want a union, but don't even know what to do? Like, I don't know, maybe that's too vague, but it feels like if we're going to get these things like Medicare for all. We need something very different from what we've been doing yeah. at this point. Yeah. Well, I think the, fir the first thing to say is, 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 you know, I think it makes sense to campaign politically on it in certain moments and opportunities and whatever, but I don't think we're going to pass Medicare for all like a normal piece of legislation. Like, oh, you know, we happen to have the right people in Congress right now. Let's get that through by one vote. Or whatever. It's not going to happen that way. And I think we all know that. Um, and, right? I mean, it's just, uh, we're talking about ripping out you know, an enormous industry <laughs> when we talk about Medicare for all. And it's just not, you can't do it in that fashion, right? It depends on a much deeper level of social struggle. And I think everyone here knows that, but I really think it's worth saying. Um, you know, I think it's helpful here to, uh, there's a couple of sort of structural points about the healthcare industry and the way work is organized in the healthcare industry that I think are worth talking about. One is a comparison to education. Um, you know, I don't think that we've totally figured out what bargaining for the common good and what that idea is supposed to mean in education either, right? But I think there are unions like the LA Teachers Union, the Chicago Teachers Union, um, that have pioneered that concept that organized groups of workers at the point of service, right? In, in, an, in, in a kind of public service industry um, can function as a kind of fulcrum of a larger coalition, right? In which their struggles and the struggles uh, and needs of the communities that they work in can overlap to a significant extent, not perfectly, right? But to a significant extent, such that, uh, you know, when CTU goes on strike here in Chicago, right? People, I mean, ordinary people uh, follow their lead. Um, I think even there, there's a problem um, in terms of thinking about, uh, or a challenge, I should say, in terms of thinking about um, what participation in those struggles can look like for people who aren't teachers. Um, and, you know, obviously they're simple versions of that, like, you know, voting for the people the CTU endorses and so on. But I think it's a bigger organizational question. Um, and, you know, then we can kind of take that comparison and think about healthcare. What's different about healthcare? Well, uh, public education is overwhelmingly public, or education is overwhelmingly public, uh, healthcare is overwhelmingly private. Um, but, it has a very large footprint of the public sector in it, which I'm gonna talk more about in a second because it's really I think, important to this comparison. Education is occupationally more compact 
Uh, I mean, there is an occupational hierarchy in, in schools and in school systems, but it's, it's not as uh, large, you know, it's not as, as stratified as the healthcare system, right? Which runs from, uh, you know, nursing assistants and, you know, people who work in the cafeteria up to doctors, obviously. Um, and, you know, PhD nurses and so on. That's a much, much more stratified and gradated occupational hierarchy, which obviously makes um, unity harder to achieve. And as we all know, right, that hierarchy maps onto race and onto gender and onto um, citizen and immigration status in a whole bunch of ways, um, which structures the difficulties of organization. Um, but I wanna talk a bit more about uh, the public private thing in healthcare, which I think is sort of the key in thinking about this. Um, I think the way we should see the healthcare industry is not just as a private industry, um, but rather as a, uh, what labor law scholars like to call a fissured industry. Um, and this is a concept that's developed in, in, in labor law and labor studies of the past couple decades. And a, like a good example of it is a franchise like a McDonald's. Um, right? We all know it's hard to organize a McDonald's because of the franchise arrangement, right? In which the costs borne by the franchisee who owns the store are pretty fixed by the franchise contract that they have with McDonald's HQ. And so they'll do anything to not recognize the union, right? Because they can't actually uh, really change or control that much about how they run the store. Um, and that's sort of why, you know, $15 in a union kind of became just $15, right? Um, in, the, in the fast food campaign a decade ago. Um, and, you know, we all know the bosses lie about what they can and can't afford, but it's also true that behind the lie somewhere, the way our the way the capitalist economy is structured, right? It is true that bosses actually can't always afford everything, right? And that is an important part of working class strategy um, is figuring out how to navigate that problem. That competition and, the, and economic pressure on employers is passed on to workers, and we have to struggle around that. Um, so in healthcare, I, I want to kind of argue to you all that healthcare is actually also a franchised industry, uh, and the franchisor is the government, um, in the form most of all of Medicare and Medicaid, um, but also in a million other ways. Um, there's a whole system of tax subsidy. There's the way that the government regulates private sector insurance and employment in private. You know, uh, the way that employment generates private sector insurance. Um, you know, as we kind of know from Obamacare, but there's a whole, whole history of this going right back to the formation of the CIO and the first health plans that they won. Um, so the federal government's hands and state government's hands are really deep in the healthcare industry uh, and really have given it its shape, but in very few places do they actually show, right, in the form of like public ownership and administration. And instead, what they have are these franchisees who we know in the healthcare industry as bosses, right, uh, administrators, um, who are the people who we have to deal with. And when healthcare was added to the National Labor Relations Act in the 70s, um, this was one of the first things that unionists realized, uh, you know, is that they would organize a hospital and they would, you know, win union recognition and they would go to bargaining. And the administrator would say, well, we'd love to help you, but you really have to take it up with Albany or Sacramento or whatever, um, with the state capital, right? Which is, uh, basically determining our budget uh, in various ways. And again, that's both probably a lie in many details and also fundamentally true at some, at some level. Um, and I think this needs to be the starting point of a kind of political strategy to answer John's question. Um, since there is a structural institutional separation between workers and the real site of control um, or the real site of power over the industry that determines working conditions. And we can see this really, really clearly, especially in long-term care and home care, but it's true in hospitals too. Um, then what that means is that the problem is inevitably, I mean, the, the healthcare workers' problems are inevitably political problems. Um, and they have a fundamentally political character because when, the, when health policy is determining what happens in a hospital, what happens in a nursing home, what happens in a home care agency, right? What, how many staff they're gonna be on a floor or how many hours a staff member will spend with a worker, uh, how many days people get to spend in the hospital or not or whatever, right? They're, they're determining labor conditions. Health policy is always and everywhere labor market policy. And this is a kind of key point I try to make in the book. Um, and 
so what that means then I think is that um, there's this challenge for healthcare workers to figure out how their workplace struggles, their industrial struggles can become political struggles. And that is a version of the question, the CTU question, right? How can healthcare workers draw the, real, the very materially real connection between their need for better staffing, higher wages, you know, safer jobs, everything the healthcare workers need, and the people who they take care of who also need those things, although they see those things in different form, right? They don't see them in this, in, in, under the same names, but they're the same needs. Um, and I think, you know, in the case of the school system, not that this is perfect, but I think often teachers unions are able to be recognizable to the parents and the children of the communities that they work in as the obvious voice for those needs. And I don't think, because of the fragmentation of the healthcare industry, I don't think that uh, we figured out how we could have such a recognizable voice. And I also think uh, work relationships between healthcare workers and patients are shorter, typically. And that's not always true, right? Home care, long-term care, but generally they're shorter. But on the other hand, they're also more intense um, because they occur in moments of need. And so from my perspective, I think what that calls on us to think about is how to form organizations that healthcare workers are, are in some way, again, the fulcrum of, the leadership of, uh, and that their unions are kind of driving, but that people who rely on the healthcare system in some way as patients or as family of patients also have a role and a place in um, to both put a direct economic and industrial pressure on employers and also to kind of contest the broader political field that is fundamental in healthcare working conditions. Um, and I think is when we figure out how to build those kinds of organizations that we're gonna be really cooking with gas in a different kind of way about, about Medicare for all. Sorry, that was such a long answer. Um, I think one thing you that also raised in my mind is since I'm in SCIU, this complicated thing that SCIU has done over the years where we represent care workers in the public sector and so uh, institutionally, we've ended up negotiating alongside the boss with the government, with the payer. And it's become really confusing for members who have a militant point of view because their parent union is, say, is um, sending the message that we have a shared strategic interest with our boss. And I think that that's like, had a really negative impact on like rank and file organizing for our members. I would be curious along that lines, uh, Gabe, do you have any, you know, things to lift from the book about sort of the steel workers and are there lessons to be learned from the ways they, you know, fought for, you know, the healthcare system we have now or that, you know, the ways that they handled change, uh, you know, as a, as the industry started to um, deindustrialize? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'll try to take those questions in opposite order. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing about the steel workers was that um, there's many interesting things about steel workers, but um, the kind of odd combination of quite intense militancy on one level. Uh, I mean, as John said, right, the longest strike in U.S. history is the is the 59 steel strike in terms of person hours idled. It's like half a million workers for four months. Um, and you know every contract in the, in the in the steel industry had to get settled, literally every one for the whole post-war period by the president in the Oval Office, pretty much, um, because it just generated such a big problem when the steel workers went on strike, and they would do it, you know. Um, but that was in combination with you know totally uh, authoritarian bureaucracy, uh, kind of ossified, you know, um, politics in all of the, in many of the locals. Um, you know, intense internal racism, um, it's a whole civil rights struggle inside the Steelworkers Union in the 70s. Um, and, you know, you can go down the list like this. Uh, and so there's this kind of paradox of economic militancy and um, ideological uh, passivity, basically, um, that made them quite unprepared for deindustrialization because deindustrialization um, was not, you couldn't beat it that way, right? Um, if you were gonna beat it, it had to be, again, political in some form. Um, and, you know, whether that meant, might've meant industrial policy and a kind of different government in, investment strategy, 
Or, you know, there's a really interesting moment which is connected to the origins of labor notes, right? The Sadlowski campaign in the late 70s, uh, which was this kind of rank and file democratic left-wing insurgency in the union that probably did actually win and had the election stolen, but we'll never know. Um, and, um, you know, Sadlowski, uh, when he was running for president, he had been the president of the Chicago area district. And when he was running for president of the whole union, um, he infamously gave this interview to Penthouse. And you know, we gave West of that separately, but um, in which he said, um, you know, the last 10 years we've fallen from 400,000 to 300,000 steel workers. Let's take it down to 100,000. No one wants to be doing this. Um, and he gave a whole, you know, he was an environmentalist and he was anti war. Um, and this kind of beautiful thing he says in this interview where he says, you know, all of these guys who are, you know, spending their lives inhaling fumes and staring into the furnaces and, you know, boiling away and dying in injuries are poets and doctors, or they could be, right? Um, and, um, right, that's actually an ideological and a political vision uh, of the union as something other than the kind of machine for winning economic gains, although that's important, and he agreed that that was important, but it was an idea that we could take the union's power while it still exists and try to renegotiate the larger class structure of the country in some way. Um, and, you know, maybe that was a kind of pipe dream. He certainly didn't get to do that. Um, but I think, you know, it's instructive in thinking about uh, this question of economic struggle and political political struggle and the relationship between them. And political struggle could be broad, right? Doesn't it, it means elections, but it means a million other things too. Um, but, um, involves changing, challenging, transforming the state in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess that kind of goes to Felix's question or Felix's point um, about some of the kind of contradictions that arise in these cross-class collaborations that are part of the structure of the healthcare industry and the ways that collective bargaining works in the healthcare industry. And I, you know, I don't have a great answer about it. I mean, I think, you know, there's an interesting story developing now. I'm sure some folks know about it with SEIU in New York. Uh, around home care, um, there's a big fight for you know better working conditions for home care workers, which basically basically means a bigger Medicaid allocation, right? Um, for all the reasons that we've been talking about, um, and SEIU and a lot of the providers are allies in Albany fighting for that. At the same time, as workers in New York City are saying that you know SEIU that shops that have contracts with SEIU are engaged in wage theft and uh, you know. Over, you know, contract violations and overwork and various things. Um, and the union's response, and as well as the provider's response is, sorry, take it up with the governor. Um, and, you know, it's one of these kind of challenging contradictions because on the one hand, of course, they're, of course workers are right. And for that matter, patients are right to fight with the union leadership and with, um, you know, with the provider obviously about negligent, abusive, and exploitative conditions, and they have to do that. Um, at the same time as the problem really ultimately actually is in Albany, or rather the problem actually is in the structure of the healthcare system and how money is allocated. Um, and so I think the challenge, it's one of these things where you kind of have to hold both, hold both ends at the same time in your mind, right? The challenge is like how to kind of maximize the militancy of our struggles on the ground in workplaces where union bureaucracy is collaborating with management, even though actually we also want that collaboration to work in a kind of it, on, on some things in a day to day way. Um, and I don't think that that's an impossible task. I just think it's a difficult and, and challenge, you know, a um, delicate one. And you know, obviously, the better organized shops are, the more it's going to be possible to make sense of that among workers. Um. Kind of building off of what you're saying, Gabe, one of the things that I was thinking uh, as we're kind of reading those anecdotes about, you know, what would a future look like, you know, nursing and being like a bedside, like healthcare worker is really like a dangerous, violent, hard thing. And we're always talking about burnout as like a issue. Um, you know, my friends in the emergency room are like dealing with 30% turnover every year. Um, and it's just, it really is intense. Like I put in six and a half years in the medical ICU. It's, they took part of my soul and thinking about how we could get, um, you know, the German steel workers were in the news like a couple of years ago for negotiating less work 
for similar, but being able to maintain the same pay. And, um, and one of the things that we're fighting for here in Illinois is like a, a nurse patient ratio bill, which is very similar to what they've passed in California. And we got that. We, it feels like one of those fights where it's going to be enormous and it doesn't feel like we're quite there with the understanding with how big that fight's going to be. And that's kind of like a step in that direction, right? Forcing the work or forcing employers to hire the amount of nurses that it takes to actually be safe, right? At work. Um, so I don't know if you've got any insight or any thoughts about those sorts of arrangements where it's like, you know, union nurses and regular nurses who aren't in a union have been able to like to do that work of forcing safe con working conditions. Cause you know, we, I get paid enough. I'm not concerned about my money. I know coworkers that are, but I'm fine. But if our nurse patient ratios were actually normal or like something closer to safe, maybe I'd go back into critical care. Yeah. I, it's just like, I don't know. What are you thinking about? <laughs> what are your thoughts I on mean, that? It, it kind of goes to this earlier thing about, um, you know, the way, like, the ways that our system, we think about it as being so inefficient and sort of bloated. And in one way it is that, but also it's not big enough, right? <laughs> um, in terms of actually how many people there are to do the work. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the, it, the, it makes a ton of sense to have kind of it, it, uh, immediate struggles over staffing levels, both through collective bargaining and through, you know, um, electoral politics where that's, where that's viable, which is obviously not everywhere. Um, and, you know, I think even once you have that, right, you have to fight constantly to enforce and enforce those regulations and to try to keep them from being uh, eroded in, in various ways. And there's obviously management has a million ways of doing that. Um, but, you know, I think that like as a kind of immediate site of struggle is a good one uh, because it does go centrally to the issue of how um, you know, working conditions and the way that the healthcare system takes care of the whole society are connected to each other. Um, that being said, you know, what I also think, you know, among socialists, it makes sense for us to be thinking about what would it actually mean to have a society where nursing was, you know, and all kinds of care work were uh, rewarding and sustainable and um, you know, plentiful all at the same time. Um, and, you know, I think from that perspective, once you start to ask that question, it takes you pretty quickly, I think, to a place where you have to imagine caregiving is something that implicates all of us much, much more, right? Um, and, you know, one story that the book tells is how uh, work that was performed by women for free in the family got sucked into the healthcare system, basically, right? I mean, we all know that a large portion of kind of low level healthcare, uh, you know, caretaking is always done inside the family. And, you know, that in a kind of patriarchal, you know, world of like Fordist industrial cities, uh, that was that was women's job almost exclusively. Um, and, you know, part of the transition of the industrialization and the growth of the healthcare in industry was the transition of some of that work into kind of formalized settings as women themselves increasingly went into formalized setting, you know, went from being wives to being nursing assistants. Um, but I, I think, you know, without wanting to romanticize or say anything about that arrangement of the family is good, I think, that, again, we can extract something from it, right? Which is the idea of a society where, um, people, you know, ordinary people think of it as our, their job to take care of each other more and how the health, the formal healthcare system could be a hub of that in a different kind of way. Um, and, you know, this is kind of pushing in a more utopian direction than we're going to, you know, win in, in Springfield this year with J.B. Pritzker or something like that. Um, but um, I do think that it's possible to imagine, you know, if we won a bunch of staffing fights and the healthcare system started to get larger, right, uh, in terms of its footprint and your jobs started to get more sustainable and there was less burnout and less stress, um, that people would maybe want to work fewer hours, right? As you're saying, John. And as people wanted to work fewer hours, you would then want to start to ask the question of like, okay, well, what would it mean to work not 40 hours, but 30? What would it mean to work 10? What would it mean to work five? 
right? And not for everyone, right? But maybe it should be my job as a college professor to do my, you know, 30 hours a week as a professor and five hours a week of caregiving at the hospital down the block. Um, and again, this is, you know, I think going beyond the kind of normal questions that we need to be asking about in, in everyday class struggle. Um, but I think it's actually important in thinking about what a genuinely democratic healthcare system would look like. Um, it would implicate all of us because the need is so immense. And it's actually what it means to be a society at some level uh, is to take care of one another. And it's, uh, you know, from my own perspective, it's very hard to imagine a genuine socialism where we are not all responsible for like looking after the disabled folks and old folks on our block and that kind of thing. And I think that is the ultimate direction in which shorter hours points. And that's what's very exciting about that as a kind of um, line of struggle, even though I think it also goes through the state in important ways. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to kind of drag this back down to a more terrestrial place. No, I'm sorry for I getting like this. <laughs> I like this, I mean, I'm not. Um, uh, but I do, yeah, <laughs> I like where this is going. Uh, but we do have some questions that have um, some some more uh, uh, concrete questions. So I I hope this is in the same, at least kind of, you know, on the, on the path to that. Uh, but Sean asked a question actually that I think um, is interesting, you, you sort of hinted at below, and maybe we can have you speak more to, which is um, the question about, uh, do you think healthcare workers have a similar degree of economic and political power in the modern economy because of, of these developments um, in the way that auto and steel used to be central, for instance? Um, and I think that also, I also wonder, and I can, I'm going to throw in one more question and you can decide how you want to answer. Um, but Russell asked, uh, is it a detrimental uh, detriment that in many cases our nurses unions are not the same unions as behavioral health, home health, long-term care? Uh, uh, I work for a nurses union, our lack of members in care settings other than hospitals seem to potentially hurt our analysis and our campaign building horizons. So I guess thinking about these questions of sort of like, what do our current structures look like? And, and do we have power? And, uh, you know, what, what does that mean for us? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. I mean, no, right? The answer is that healthcare workers do not have the kind of power that auto and steel workers used to have. I think it's worth thinking about what they could, but how or how they could, we have to think about that. But it's not going to be in exactly the same way. Um, for all of the reasons that we've been talking about, about public and private, and, you know, the kind of um, you know, profit structure of healthcare and these kinds of things. And also, you know, the, the very basic level that this, I mean, the structure of economic leverage is different. Um, you know, the power of the CIO unions arose because relatively small groups of workers could paralyze huge amounts of capital. Um, and, you know, then they got large numbers of workers to participate. Um, but, it, it, that doesn't, it doesn't work in the same, I mean, the strike power doesn't work in the same way in healthcare. Um, and that's why, you know, I think having even an equivalently large sector of the workforce, uh, even an equally angry and militant one, you know, for, in people's own internal experiences, I'm sure, uh, doesn't translate directly into the same kind of power. Now, does that mean that it cannot possibly? I hope not. I, I wrote the book to kind of argue not, but I think that, um, Healthcare workers' power, I think, arises from the same thing that limits it. Uh, and that's to say, uh, the political, the kind of fragmented and fi or fissured structure of the healthcare industry and the ways that it's a kind of political, that it's fundamentally shaped by political processes, by public policy, but that healthcare workers can't access that directly. That's the core of why health it's hard for healthcare workers to wield economic power, but it's also the potential source of, of enormous political power, right? And we have seen when social reproduction or care workers are, do behave in militant ways and, um, you know, do engage in struggle that their communities care about, that their communities do sometimes follow them. And that, I think, is a potentially enormous amount of power if we can find the organizational form for it. Um, and I don't think that's, that's not as in the clouds as my like little communist spiel a minute ago. Um, I think that's something that we can really, you know, we actually see small forms of all of the time. Um, you know, we haven't figured out how to do it in a large and sustained way. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's quite common that communities actually do kind of rally around healthcare workers unions 
in important ways that do bring genuine political pressure to bear on them in, in struggles. Um, and I think the question is how to expand and deepen that. Um, and that I think it will be the form of healthcare workers power that is equivalent to the form that steel workers and auto workers once had. And it is more political and less economic at some level. Um, I think to this other question about fragmentation, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I look, <laughs> there's no union that should be the right union for that is the problem. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I think the difficulties of organizing a, a genuinely industrial healthcare workers union would be very large. Um, you know, again, given the degree of stratification and the, all the social forms that it takes. Um, but I think we're not really trying enough to figure it out. I mean, it's easy for me to say, it's not my job, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'll say, you know, John started this uh, discussion with an analogy to, uh, of the university where we both work um, to, you know, a big integrated steel mill or auto plant. And that's really, that, that I had that same thought when I was starting this book, which is, you know, because I was at, uh, I was doing my PhD at Yale, uh, which is a, you know, a New Haven is a company town, deindustrialized place that where now the university and the hospital dominate employment and where all of the workers at the university are in Unite Here together. And my day-to-day -day life, much more than writing, researching and writing my dissertation was like organizing and trying to figure out how to make that nominal unity real, right? To, how to convince astronomy graduate students that actually like they should do what the custodial workers union says. Um, and how to also take that message into the kind of surrounding community and organize the community politically against the university and against the hospital um, because it, you know, it is the company in the company town. And it was extremely difficult to do that, but it was possible. And there were moments where you could really see that it was possible um, because the, these, these massive institutions, although they don't have economic choke points in the, in the way that older industrial institutions or current logistics companies do, they do touch everyone's lives around them in pretty intense ways. And this was something I discovered as my kind of union activity thrust me into uh, like local, you know, local political work in various ways. You can knock on any door in New Haven and you know, I, I, would, I had this experience so many times. You would see people think like, oh, you know, white Yale kid wants something from me, great. Um, and I realized you could get past that if you could figure out what, in what way Yale had fucked this person. And if I can communicate, I'm here because Yale is fucking me over in various ways. And I actually can make that transparent to you pretty straightforwardly. You know, I'm a teaching assistant. I'm at the bottom of the ladder. Um, we're trying to organize a union. Our union is involved in your city council election. How has Yale fucked you over? Oh, as your landlord, their cops arrested your kid. You're in debt to their hospital. Um, I mean, you can go down the list, right? Um, and they're pushing you out of your neighborhood. Uh, and I do think that these big anchor service institutions um, of which hospitals are really the prime example and especially academic hospitals, they just sweep up people in their wake in, a hu in huge numbers. And we ought to be thinking much more about how to organize those people into the same spaces as workers and figuring out what, what issues connect them. Uh, and I think that would be easier to do where we have more industrial organization. Um, both because it will create the kind of organizing resources in a different kind of way and because it will make much clearer why a person in debt to University of Chicago Hospital ought to identify with the organization of workers there. Because if you're asking them to, to identify with the tech workers union or the, or the dietary union or whatever, that's way harder, right? Um, then it's like the workers at the hospital want to ally with the people who the hospital, who depend on the hospital and are exploited by it too. That's a much more straightforward thing to figure out how to organize. You're, you're kind of making me think about, well, the parallels and differences between steel workers and healthcare workers. And another, well, something you talk about in the book is how the worker power in the steel industry led to the healthcare economy through various like large social pressures and economic pressures. But what you didn't explore as much directly is like also how the steel industry itself made people sick and have a need for healthcare. And, um, in a way, there is a contradiction in being a steel worker fighting to maintain the steel industry because you're harming yourself at the same time. And I think in healthcare, we are ex 
experiencing very directly now that like our work makes us sick and we're healthcare providers. And it's, it's a very, it's a moment of contradiction where we can't ignore that because it's just so obvious right now. Um, and it feels like, you know, as you're kind of talking about and people are talking about staffing ratios in the chat, there's more opportunities now in our context of healthcare to think, to, to bargain and fight, maybe not just bargain, but to have fights that are ab about transforming systems um, while also like improving our immediate quality of life. And so maybe this is, a, this is a question if either of you wanna address it. And also I just kind of thought maybe if people have stuff they wanna put in the chat of examples of what they're doing in their healthcare workplace that's that's bringing in something that's a little bigger than just these like direct um, workplace improvements to their lives, given these opportunities we have right now. John, do you want to respond? Or should I respond? Um, my brain was kind of a little bit off. So why don't you uh, respond? And if I've got anything to add, I'll add. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, you know, it's a it's an important question. It's a hard one. Um, I mean, it's connected, obviously, to these questions around staffing and around, you know, ultimately less intense workload. Um, but I think, from my perspective, um, you know, the more workers in healthcare workplaces have power to enforce. I mean, both there's winning those kind of rules, right? And then the more workers in, uh, have the power to enforce those rules themselves or together with their immediate coworkers, um, the more I think they're also going to be in a position to, um, or they're not just in a position, they're organically going to find themselves. And I think you hear these stories from healthcare workers all the time, making decisions about their own well-being and the well-being of their patients in a kind of qualitative way. And I think those things are really deeply connected to each other in the fabric of daily life, you know, on a hospital floor, in a nursing home. Um, you know, I think like I, uh, I did an interview with a, with a CNA in a, in a nursing home from Illinois, uh, I guess two years ago now, um, a nursing home that had a ton of early COVID deaths and Illinois has, uh, you know, passed two years ago, a tighter, um, staffing regulation for nursing homes, which, um, mandates two and a half care hours per day, I think is the number per patient, um. And you know this nursing home like never has that has that many staff working. I mean they're just constantly in violation of the law. Um, and this this person is a shop steward in SEIU, and um, you know described to me in this interview the ways that um, you know just the way like the way that she keeps on her boss about how they're constantly in violation of this law, how she's constantly reporting him, how she like knows the person who she, to, to talk to at you know the Illinois Medicaid whatever nursing home. To, quality office and like has their has their number on her cell phone which i'm sure doesn't work that well right but like is um you know on the one hand it is kind of like model how a shop steward should be obviously um but at the same time also she i remember she described it to me she described it to me in terms of her own safety um you know during covid and you know her I think she had a kid who was uh, invulnerable or immunocompromised in some way and the way that she was trying to navigate that um, and the way that she would bring that into her confrontations with her boss, and also obviously the safety of the patients. Um, and, uh, you know, this was someone who seemed to take great pleasure in the way that Labor Notes would hope in, you know, being a kind of militant shop steward. Um, and I don't know, I haven't been to her nursing home, I've just talked to her, right? But, I, I, but she uh, really described to me kind of creating a kind of like bubble around herself and her co, you know, the coworkers who kind of followed her of not just militancy, um, but a kind of qualitative, a different kind of qualitative workplace culture, both about their own safety and about their patient safety, because they, they had developed a practice of like never fucking putting up with it, right? And that really meant something about that patient who's 98 and you know has a respiratory condition, that worker who lives with her mom. Um, and it was really deeply embedded in those very human level realities. And I feel like um, it, sort of, it seems sort of banal to say, I guess, but I think when we're figuring out how to fight over these questions on the shop floor in a day-to-day -day way, uh, it's really important that those things actually be really present because like bosses in the healthcare industry want to dehumanize care. That's like what they're trying to do all of the time. And 
you all know this obviously, but uh, to make it to make the kind of accounting decisions uh, that they that are good for them to make that make workers and patients vanish as people. And I really think uh, there's a kind of almost a kind of cultural question about how we think and talk and relate to each other about the kind of humanity of what we're struggling over. That is, I don't know if that's, that's not a very good answer, but I think that's sort of what I think about in response to that. Um, kind of like building off that, like thinking to my experiences where we've been like in, you know, the ICU or critical care areas where you see a patient or you see a staffing decision be made where people literally die and that like, and then your patients going through that is really kind of, uh, it's traumatizing thing to go through as a nurse because they hammer in your head, like, this is on you. This is always on you. That's like part of the discipline of like nursing school is that you are responsible for the patient outcome. Right. And thinking like the times when I've seen management move fastest to resolve a staffing issue is when one of my coworkers said, we're not taking report tonight until, or today until we get more staff and all of us agreeing that that was what we were going to do. And that's kind of like, the sort of thing that makes some of my, uh, you know, union staff people a little nervous, but thinking about when we all went on strike in 2019, we were the first union hospital to go on strike for nurse of nurses to go on strike, um, in decades. And then watching that kind of ripple out into other, like first it was us, then it was, uh, INA nurses, then it was Cook County nurses and like nurse, like hospitals kind of like watching what happened where we were able to pull it off and we got wins out of it. And then all of a sudden, like, there's like this weird thing where when you start ta uh, talking with staff and they're like, you're going to talk with other nurses about joining union, but don't talk about strikes because everyone's afraid of strikes. And, but watching some, the opposite thing happen where people seeing that your union can support people going on strikes and your union does, and we go on strike was the thing that lit up, you know, it seemed like it brought more people to our union than anything we've ever done before. And just thinking about there's like this, uh, this old, this essay that I list, uh, read a long time ago called the stopwatch and the wooden shoe and thinking about the militancy of CIO work, uh, stewards where you would have the whistle stop strike and thinking about like, how do we like, what is the healthcare equivalent of the whistle stop strike, you know, and how do we like encourage that? But at the same time, wh where do we get like, you know, strap the spine onto some of our union staff where it's like, don't freak out that we're doing this because this is the only way we're going to win. I don't know. Like, I'm just thinking about how is it that strikes build power um, of all of us together? Like nurses that aren't in unions have higher wages because my union went on strike in Chicago. And just thinking about, I don't know, like, do you have some thoughts about how that's worked out historically? And then how maybe you've seen that in other areas with like healthcare? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, like, you know, I think the, the one of the big kind of early discoveries for me as I first started to kind of learn, my, or have my own organizing learning trajectory is that, you know, it's not that workers don't want to fight, it's that they don't want to lose, right? Um, and it's really easy to mistake not wanting to lose for not wanting to fight um, because people mainly think that they're going to lose and they're mainly right. Um, and um, so, you know, obviously, if, as you're saying, John, successful struggle has, you know, has these ripple effects because people realize that they may not have read their situation in the only way that you can read it. There may be other options for them. Um, and I think, you know, uh, a real, I mean, what you're saying about how to kind of do that in a day-to-day -day way on the shop floor, I think is a really important question. And again, I think, um, you know, healthcare workers have both a challenge and an advantage in the way that their patients' lives are on the line in some form. Um, it's a challenge because obviously management wields that over you to keep you in line. Um, you know, with, if you don't do what we say, right, you are in some way betraying the needs and, and you know, harming the patients. Um, but at the same time, you all are the people who know better, right? Um, and are the ones who are actually making care functional in a dysfunctional situation. 
Um, and I do think that that sets up the real possibility of, you know, whether it's like you're saying, John, um, or, you know, like the shop steward I was describing a minute ago, sets up the possibility of, you know, just amping up the level of friction on the shop floor uh, kind of all the time. And, you know, it's not possible to do everywhere, obviously, but where you have organization and it can make, when you do that, you know, uh, recklessly, it can make it harder to organize, obviously. Um, but where there is organization or where there's a possibility of kind of cohering strong organization soon, that can be really important. I always tell students in labor history classes that um, in 19th century workshops, um, like in especially very skilled workshops, um, it was very common for there to be a, a norm that workers would not work if management was looking at them. Um, that you know, you if like if you were being observed, but say nothing of timed and measured and you know sped up, but if you were being observed, you would put down your tools. Um, and um, you know that obviously that comes out of a different material situation and a different moment in the history of the working class movement and various things like that. But I think in that um, you know thinking about the relationship between yourselves in the hospital and the patients who you're taking care of as the kind of core productive function of the hospital and you know your administrator on duty and their supervisor and their supervisor as interloping parasites which is what they are um, then i think you know there there is something in um, in that principle of like excuse me i'm trying to take care of this person would you back the fuck off please that i think is a like actually an important principle to, uh, I assume yeah, I've got to square in this company. I assume that's okay. <laughs> um, cat, the horses out of the barn on that. Um, but I think like it is actually something that we should probably try to think about how to build into our organizing more. Um, and I think that, you know, that it's that um, feeling and that kind of, uh, or that sentiment and that kind of demand that is how healthcare workers can take their responsibility for patients, which is used as a weapon over you and a burden on you and turn it into a source of power. Um, and that's hard because, you know, also that there's a kind of Superman quality, Superman nurse kind of quality in that, that you, it's not, it shouldn't be your job to manifest all the time, but I do, you know, and I think that's, that opens up a whole other can of worms, which we've been talking about, obviously. Um, but I do think that is your source of power in, in the day to day. I want to jump in. Uh, there's a question in the uh, Q&A that I think is relevant, but it, it also makes me think back to the labor notes, Ed Sedlowski, uh, Pittsburgh example of, of knowing that both we have these unions that are not uh, coordinating with each other, for one. So we have, you know, we don't just have the United Steelworkers. We have even just on this call, there's like four to five different international healthcare unions. <laughs> I mean, how many hospitals are there with like eight bargaining units? Sorry. Oh yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, there's 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 no coordination. There, we saw this during the pandemic. If ever there was going to be a time when healthcare unions would like band together for a set of demands, you know, you would think maybe that would be it. But we didn't see that. Um, and of course, our labor notes perspective is is changing. Our unions has to come from, you know, from the shop floor has to come from um, democratic rank and file action. Um, but it also makes, which, you know, Ed Sadlowski, of course, also thought, but um, uh, that's my tie in. Uh, Dennis has a question in the, the Q&A about, I think, an industry shift that um, is weighing on a lot of people's minds, which is this question of agency nurses. And I think there's a real, you know, I think there's been some like doom and gloom forecasting that there's like a real, this could really be the precipice of like a different way that hospitals are trying to do healthcare, like in a, in a wide scale union busting way. Um, and I wonder if our unions are up to the task of tackling, you know, the, the question of agency nurses. So Dennis asked, um, you know, it's, a, it's been at great cost to hospitals. It can be divisive in some workplaces. It's got all these things. What's your sense of sort of agency nurses? And my question then is like, do you think this represents a kind of industrial change that our unions are not in front of. That's a or really am I being do, too doom and gloom? You can tell me I'm like. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought a lot about it. I can't say I have great answers about it. I mean, um, it's pretty hard for me to see how, I mean, it's obvious why they would want to 
um, flexibilized nursing. Um, but given that the model is depends on overpayment, um, I mean, you know, obviously no worker is overpaid, but relative to other nurses, um, given that the model depends on overpayment, it's different for the moment from you know classic forms of subcontracting. Um, and in that way, it's pretty hard for me to see how you know RNs at large could be kind of displaced in this way. Um, you know, I mean, I know that there's a um, there's an effort right now, which I can't imagine will pass, but I guess you never know in California to um, to put through an initiative like the same people who did um, or the same law firm is behind is you know kind of doing the legal work on it that did the prop um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the number but the the Uber twenty two thank you um, an initiative to uh, legislatively reclassify web based um, agency nurses because you know there's a lot of like web systems for doing this now um, so Uber, Uber for nurses to to reclassify them as independent contractors. Um, and, you know, it's sort of hard for me to imagine that will pass uh, and it has various legal problems that might get thrown out in court even if it did pass. Um, but, uh, you know, short of something like that, uh, it's difficult for me to see how that, that could bring about a kind of large scale, um, you know, disruption, as they would say, to the industry uh, in a direct way, just because, uh, you know, it, what, it consists of hospitals overpaying in order to hire fewer people, um, and they can only, they can't they can only go so far doing that. Um, that being said, um, obviously it uh, you know it is serving as a device to disorganize nurses, uh, you know, industrially, and to uh, avoid giving in you know, or to resist staffing demands uh, and to to um, you know, try to generate forms of division among, you know, healthcare workers. And, um, you know, it costs them some money to do that, but it's worth it to them, it would seem. Um, and, you know, I think that that uh, then creates a budgetary crunch for hospitals that they will then use to, you know, bring the hammer down on other workers, right? They'll say, well, we, you know, we're, we're already operating in the red. Um, and again, when they say that, it's, at one level true, even though it's also a situation they've engineered. Um, and so I think, you know, in that way, it's important to resist it. Although obviously, you know, one doesn't necessarily want to turn agency nurses themselves into the antagonist and that kind of thing. So it's, it's tricky. And I, I don't know exactly where it goes. I think, you know, one thing, I'll, the other thing I'll say about it is that I'm sure you all know there, there was this kind of proposed bill, you know, federal legislation uh, to cap nurse wages in response to this. Which is just like incredible to see. Like I, I think that would be the only example of federal law capping any workers' wages, and it would be nurses. Um, and you know, again, I think that kind of goes right to this point that like the relationship between you and your boss in a hospital is fundamentally political, um, such that when things kind of get askew and out of whack because of an emergency, like suddenly Congress is implicated. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, that I would actually, if I worked in a hospital and if I, if I were a steward or an organizer, I would be talking about that in those terms as well as, isn't this crazy and bad? Because it actually indicates your importance and power. Um, I have one last question and then I'll be quiet um, because I think it's a thing that has been kind of brought up a little bit and danced around where we're talking about these management and uh, administration kind of inserting themselves into this process that fundamentally workers are like really have a lot more control of over than in say like the average car factory or something like that. Um, and as you know, good socialists who are in the union movement, a thing that I don't hear enough about is the idea that nurses and healthcare workers are equipped in a way maybe that we haven't seen workers in a long time to actually not just like, you know, society owns a thing, but that we could also control it and nurses and healthcare workers owning and controlling at least, you know, how healthcare is delivered feels like something that's way more achievable because 
my boss is a nurse, her boss is a nurse. Nurses run hospitals. And I, you know, one of the, we're helping uh, nurses down in Southeast Kentucky that are working in a former union owned hospital and thinking about how union power could be used to begin to kind of take these things back from private industry that just doesn't seem to be interested in, like, where's the value added for those people? All right. And that'll be the last thing I got to say. Yeah, I mean, right. You know, the, the uh, I don't know, folks, I imagine folks mainly know the story also of the Lincoln Hospital occupation in the Bronx and um, by the Young Lords. Um, but, you know, I think your, your point is, is, you know, I think even if we don't want to kind of go to a utopian vision of what, you know, our, our egalitarian society would look like, right? I think, again, it's important in the course of everyday struggle and organizing um, that, you all have the skills necessary to operate the institution and the skills that your bosses have, the skills that your bosses have are about maximizing reimbursement um, as opposed to uh, allocating care uh, in a, you know, equal and humane way. Um, and I just think, you know, every day, every, like every, you know, all the, just the daily cycle of, of your shift in your hospital generates a thousand pieces of evidence of that. And, um, you know, I think like that would be if I, you know, if I were one of you and if I were working in, in, in organizing in, 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 a, in a healthcare workplace, I don't know. I mean, I sometimes tell, tell like when I've done organizer trainings in the past, I sometimes tell, tell people like keep a notebook, not necessarily for evidence, though that can be good too, but just like as a way of accumulating for yourself and clarifying your own thoughts about all of the ways that you actually have material knowledge and power in your situation. Um, and I think that can be a really useful thing to do with other workers who you're trying to kind of agitate also, right? Is asking them to think, to just try to keep track in some way of all of the moments in your day uh, or over the course of your week where you think something should happen one way and management for reasons that are presumably about accounting that are not totally transparent to you and said is causing it to happen another way. And if you actually get someone to keep a notebook like that or keep track like that, I think that could be a very useful organizing device. Um, and you can imagine many other versions of that kind of thing you could do, right? In meetings and, you know, in, 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 in discussion and so on. Um, the other thing I'll say on the kind of health policy side, uh, I talk about this briefly in the book, but, you know, as anxiety about healthcare costs started to become a kind of political problem in the 1970s, um, Congress created these things called health systems agencies. Uh, which don't really mainly exist in the same form anymore today, but they did generate a process that we often still have today called the certificate of need process. Um, when a hospital, you know, if I, you want to build a new wing on a hospital or do a big, any big capital project in healthcare, uh, it depends on the state, how exactly it works, but there's often a process called certificate of need in which um, the person, the entity wanting to do this has to uh, kind of make the case to some regulatory body about why it's necessary. Uh, and then there's a kind of back and forth and a process and a discussion. It's pretty toothless. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's pretty opaque. No one really pays attention to it except like lawyers and so on. But um, in the seventies, when this first was developed. Uh, so I, you know, I, I spent a long time just reading the kind of certificate of need applications in the healthcare Health Systems Agency of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Just I read their files from the 70s. And um, this is a period of rapid expansion in the industry. So there's a lot of files, there's a lot of proposals going through. And the, the actual board of this agency that reviews these proposals consisted of um, some doctors, some kind of academic experts of different kinds, some local elected officials, some kind of consumer representatives, you know, maybe the head of the local AMA, people like that, kind of med medicine adjacent sort of city father type people. Um, and um, what would happen almost always would be they would get a proposal, they would review it, and someone would say, you know, this is more of a money making scheme than a Ne you know, necessary scheme, or at least in the form that it's designed, we should reject this or ask them to modify it. There would be a political uproar and they would get overruled by the state health secretary. And that's basically how these things always went. Um, and the state health secretary said, look, if you want this to go differently, if you actually want to have someone other than healthcare administrators and their bankers 
deciding about what healthcare, literally what our healthcare institutions are going to look like in terms of the actual capital, the actual plants and machinery, then you would need these bodies that are reviewing these proposals to be democratically elected. Um, that would be the only way that you could have legitimate, sort of publicly legit, democratically legitimate review. Uh, and this was a Republican saying this in the 70s. Um, and I say all that not to say, okay, let's just do that. But that, um, again, because the power of those agencies came because if they rejected a proposal, they, they had the power to cut off a hospital to Medicare and Medicaid, which very rarely happened, but they could do it. Again, the, pu the public political presence in the industry does create all of these opportunities, potentially anyway, um, both within the everyday life of the worker and the workplace and the patient, and within the kind of political and economic institutional structure of the industry uh, to assert democratic values and power. Um, and, you know, I'll say in, in my time in New Haven, again, because we were a large cluster of organized workers in the, you know, we were the biggest such cluster in the state, basically, you know, we were sometimes able to get state legislators to do stuff. And we got the legislature to, um, pass various things that basically made the certificate of need process much more difficult for Yale New Haven Hospital as it was acquiring hosp other hospitals along the Connecticut shoreline. And we did that in hopes of then leveraging that process, I shouldn't say this like this, in the hopes of accumulating political power that the um, hospital would have to think about as it weighed how it wanted to engage in industrial relations. Um, and, um, you know, it was genuinely like good policy also, I think in various ways, right? I mean, hospital monopoly is bad for various reasons. Um, and that was why I think we were able to kind of make a good case for it to legislators and, you know, to the public. Um, but I, I think, you know, both at the political level as well as, in other words, as well as at the, um, or thinking about, you know, the health, the, the hours, you know, legislation that this nursing home worker is able to actually mobilize in her day-to-day -day life in the way I was describing earlier, as well as kind of in everyday moments of organizing and class struggle. Um, you know, this kind of paradox of a privatized public service, I think really generates these opportunities and we need to just be alert for them all the time. Okay, it is uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time. So I'm gonna wrap us up, but I actually thought that that was you just basically said all the sort of wrap of things I wanted to say. So I, I think that's actually perfect. Um, the book is The Next Shift, uh, if anyone hasn't read it and is interested. Um, I, I, I just couldn't agree more. Uh, and I, I thought it was so interesting, the, um, the way you lay out the opportunities for organizing. And I think what is such a powerful reminder for us as, as um, workers and unionists and activists that systems didn't come up this, you know, they didn't just like pop out of nowhere into these like fully formed hegemonic, you know, institutions that, um, you know, it, it wasn't always this way and it won't always be this way. And I think that in some ways that's like the most hopeful thing um, we can do sometimes is, is just be able to like uh, have historians peer through uh, all those documents. So we see how these things came about and where their weaknesses are. So thank you so much for that. Um, I for, Sorry if your question didn't get answered. Um, you can always contact me and I'll make sure questions get to Gabe. And I will make a plug for the conference. If you liked this conversation and you want to talk and learn more about organizing and healthcare, we'll see you in Chicago June 17th through 19th, 2022. You can register here. Early bird registration ends May 1st, I think. Um, thanks so much to John and Felix for pulling this together. Thanks for our network folks who joined us tonight. And if you're interested in joining, shoot me an email. Um, and I just think uh, if there's any way that we're going to support each other and learn how to tackle these huge institutions together, it's going to be um, folks like you all working across unions and across this country. So please join, join, the, join the group. Solidarity forever, folks. Thanks, everyone. Really, really great to talk to you all. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Gabe. Good night. Thanks so much, Gabe.